Good morning. Uh, well, Albany doesn't have a team that rivals the Red Sox, but um, I've actually lived for 30, the past 30 years in Washington, D.C., so in addition to the Yankees, who will always be my favorite, sorry, I was born and raised on them, uh, I've become a Nats fan. Uh, they didn't do so well in, in uh, the playoffs this year, but uh, we, we watch now both the Yankees and the Nats in our house. Uh, so first, uh, before we begin with the panel, I would like to thank, uh, on behalf of EPA, our distinguished partners who have participated with us in putting this summit together. The U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, HHS, U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development, HUD, the New York State Department of Health, the New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene, the New Jersey Department of Health, and the Puerto Rico Governor's Office. Uh, we all together are, uh, recognize uh, the importance of the subject that we're addressing today, uh, asthma as a, uh, an, an important, um, not just a medical condition, but as Dr. Landrigan put it, an epidemic in this country, and the importance of finding sustainable funding uh, for dealing with in-home interventions. Uh, as the other speakers have remarked, asthma affects nearly 26 million people in our country and is one of the most common chronic childhood diseases. I think we all know that it affects one out of 10 American children, so you can hardly have uh, uh, any family that is not affected by it. My own son had it, even though he, we grew up in a you know, very easy, clean uh, neighborhood in Washington, D.C. Um, asthma causes these children to miss school days, we know that, um, and it causes their parents to miss too many work days as a result. And in addition to the personal toll and the family toll that it takes, uh, as people have mentioned, we're spending $65 billion every year for the asthma-related costs, including hospital stays. Now, with that price tag, wouldn't you think it would be sort of obvious that when we've got um, an inexpensive and easy way uh, relatively easy compared to other solutions uh, of using at-home asthma interventions to reduce this that we could do a better job. And EPA is committed uh, to joining with all of you in trying to do that. Uh, from EPA's point of view, uh, one notable fact about asthma is that it is not an equal opportunity affliction. Asthma disproportionately affects low-income and minority communities, as we all know. Hispanic children face a higher risk of asthma than their white counterparts. Hospitals treat black children for asthma at twice the rate of white children, and asthma-related deaths among black children are four times that of white children. So EPA does see these disproportionate effects of asthma in our everyday work, and it, it doesn't surprise us anymore because in our journey we've always known that air pollution is one of the key causes of asthma and that low-income and minority communities too often take the brunt of the worst air pollution in our country. The communities too often live too close to industrial facilities, to highways, to ports, and to other sources of serious outdoor air pollution. So to EPA, with our primary responsibility having traditionally been in the outdoor uh, environment, this is an environmental injustice issue. But over the years, of course, we've learned that outdoor air pollution is not the only cause of asthma and that there are dangers, surprising dangers, in the indoor environment as well, including such common things as mold, mildew, and even common cleaning products that most of us probably have under our sink. These indoor sources of air pollution we now know add to the disproportionately high pollution burden that low-income communities already face from the outdoor air and the location of their communities. But there are easy ways, uh, relatively easy ways, uh, and inexpensive ways to treat this, and that's why this summit, um, where we are all joined together, is focused on one specific way to get at this problem, which is in-home asthma interventions. According to the National Asthma Education and Prevention Program, comprehensive asthma care has four elements. One, of course, high-quality medical care and management two, self-management education, three, environmental remediation or in-home asthma interventions, and four, medications. So evidence shows that using these tools to control asthma improves the health outcomes and does achieve a cost savings, and yet comprehensive management care is still not routinely reimbursed by the insurance companies. 
Although recent health care reforms have increased states and private insurers' opportunities to cover the costs of in-home services, many states struggle to transform these services into real policy. And that's why one of the main challenges we must address today is how to find more sustainable sources of funding for those in-home interventions. I hope we have gathered here today enough experts on this subject and enough people committed to finding the solution uh, that we will be able to find uh, ways forward together here. Our panelists on this panel are from regional, federal, state, city, and territorial governments, and each of them will speak to their commitments to move in this dire direction. I can assure you that EPA is committed to that goal, and we will do all that we can do to, uh, to participate in, in this um, very worthy endeavor. So at this point, it is my pleasure to introduce our panel. As Misha mentioned, we will not go through the bios. They have, between them, it would probably take about two hours to get through all of the distinguished um, accomplishments of this panel. Uh, but they are in your booklet, so if you would like to uh, look at the bios there, you can find out more about each of our speakers. We have Susan Horowitz from HUD, um, who is a healthy home specialist. Michelle Davis, the Regional Health Administrator of the Office of, of the Secretary of Health in Region 2. Ricardo Holligan, CMS, Division of Medicaid and Children's Health Operations. Uh, Cheryl Donald, uh, the Deputy Regional Administrator of DHHS HRSAORO. Now, you all probably know the full words for that, so I'm not going to spend them out. She's also the USVI lead, which is important. Daniel Cass, the Deputy Commissioner um, of Environmental Health for the New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene. Douglas Fish, Medical Director of the Division of Program Development and Management, Office of Health Insurance Programs of the New York State Department of Health. And Jesus Irizarry, the Health Advisor of the Puerto Rico Governor's Office. So with no further ado, I would like to ask our panelists uh, to please begin to uh, give you their perspective. We're, we're doing this in a TED presentation today, so we've asked each panelist to please spend three to five minutes uh, giving us your highlights. And please start with one fun fact about yourself. Um, it could be as simple as, where were you born and where do you come from? <laughs> Good morning, everybody. Is this Good morning. Okay. Um, I'm very pleased to be here today uh, to share some information with you. My name is Michelle Davis, and I serve as the Regional Health Administrator for um, the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. And thank you, uh, Catherine, for uh, the introductions of, of this panel. Um, first, I'd like to uh, thank the organizers of the Regional Summit on Sustainable Funding for In-Home Asthma Interventions. Uh, that would be uh, the major leaders, um, EPA, HUD, and of course, uh, staff from HHS. Uh, the information on this panel uh, today that's going to be shared uh, with all of you is very important. Um, the Office of the Regional Health Administrator, which I oversee, um, I have a number of staff that are uh, subject matter experts in women's health, uh, family planning, minority health, uh, HIV AIDS, infectious diseases. We do the broad range of uh, activities uh, across uh, public health and, and health care. Um, and we work with all of our partners uh, within HHS, so our partners at CMS, at HRSA, the Indian Health Service, uh, CDC, to support initiatives that come out of um, HHS. And so we work, par work with partners in New York, New Jersey, uh, Puerto Rico, and the Virgin Islands, uh, academic institutions, community-based organizations, faith-based organizations. So we work with anybody on education, outreach, policy, uh, implementing a program so that we can have um, healthy communities. Um, we, in particular, uh, that's related to uh, this event today, uh, we, I have a subject matter uh, lead on um, environmental health and environmental justice, and she's actually in the audience here, um, Kadish Altador. And uh, she uh, is working with us to, and with EPA, uh, to implement our regional interagency working group on environmental justice, where we've identified uh, six communities and we're working with them to uh, address issues of environmental justice in their communities. 
Um, we also uh, have many of our activities, or most of our activities, are aligned with the priorities of eliminating health disparities and uh, achieving health equity. So we know that asthma makes breathing difficult for millions of Americans, and we've heard um, some data uh, from Catherine. Approximately 40 million uh, people in the, the country, including uh, about 11 million children, have been diagnosed with asthma in their lifetimes. And I actually also have asthma, so I guess maybe that's one <laughs> fun fact. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe not so fun, uh, but I grew up in Detroit, so that's where I, I hail from. Uh, but uh, and of those uh, 39 million uh, adults and about uh, 7 million children still have asthma, um, there's a definite national impact on, on health um, for asthma that we all know about. And the estimated uh, total cost of asthma to society, including medical expenses, is about $50 billion per year. Uh, we have loss of productivity resulting from missed school or work days, uh, premature death, um, and that was about $56 billion. Uh, um, during 2001, and this is data from uh, the CDC, uh, 2001 to 2011, the number of persons with asthma in the United States increased by 28%. In most cases, the causes of asthma um, we know is unknown but there are multiple host and environmental factors that have been identified which may be involved in the development of asthma and the exacerbation of asthma symptoms. Some of the exposures associated, which you all know uh, with asthma attacks, include um, exercise, airway uh, infections, airborne allergens, pollen, mold, animal dander, uh, tobacco smoke. Uh, we have a major initiative on reducing uh, smoking. Uh, also, research has been done to examine the relationship between obesity and the development of asthma, and one highly recognized program that's addressing childhood obesity is the First Lady's Let's Move initiative, with my off which my office also oversees. Although there is no cure, asthma can be controlled with appropriate medical care, and the ex exacerbations can be prevented by avoiding exposures. The good news is that it can be managed and treated so that affected individuals can live healthy lives. HHS agencies are very involved in conducting research, developing policy, and funding programs to address asthma prevention, treatment, and control. And we also work with partners on awareness activities, and uh, it, including uh, for November, which is Chronic Obstructive Pulmonary Disease Awareness Month and Lung Cancer Awareness Month. Uh, EPA and HHS children's asthma education booklets um, have been distributed by, uh, by staff and it de they deal with um, the use, the control of asthma for both indoor and outdoor exposure. Um, H we also have worked with um, the Virgin Islands uh, very closely on strategic and coordinated efforts for many different areas of public health, including uh, the reduction of asthma. And to uh, conclude, um, I'm very happy that, uh, in particular, this conference is co-sponsored by HHS, EPA, and HUD because it aligns with one of the priorities of HHS, meaning health in all policies, meaning all sectors play a role in improving um, health and wellness. And uh, just recently, in this past week, CDC has put up a website uh, with tools for putting the social determinants of health into action, which can also be utilized to help us to address asthma. So thank you very much. Okay, uh, can you hear me? Okay. Good morning. My name is Ricardo Holligan, and I apologize, but my bio isn't in the the you know the course the summit thing because I was a late scratch. Uh, the person that was supposed uh, to do, do this had the uh, medical procedure this morning couldn't make it. And there was some confusion about who was going to do it. And even up until yesterday, I didn't realize that I was going to do it. <laughs> uh, so a little fun fact about me is that my career actually started in the Department of Health here in New York City. And I worked for the Lead Poison Prevention Program. So I know a little thing about you know, uh, environment and disease. Uh, what CMS is, uh, we really we really operate the Medicare program from beginning to end from uh, payers to uh, regulations. And what we are when it comes to Medicaid, we are actually, I would say, the financial partners of the states uh, in, in operating the program. We leave it to the states to really implement the program, 
through a contract that we have with them called the Medicaid state plan. And uh, my division, we operate in terms of when the state wants to make changes, when they want to do different things in terms of the disease management, we're the people that they come to to say, hey, we're gonna make changes and will you let us do it? And most of the time, we, we, approve, we approve it, most of the time. <laughs> uh, one thing though, I just want to say that for a long time, CMS has really been a payer, especially when it comes to Medicaid, and that's what we do, we pay. We pay as long as no, as it's uh, feasible, federally uh, responsible to pay for it, we pay. Uh, but over the last couple of years uh, through Congress, we actually now have something called the Innovation Center, which allows us to actually now fund grant projects you know, to try to do innovative things like asthma, asthma reduction prevention. So one of the things that happened this year through our Innovation Center is that they held a summit where they got together some of the awardees that they gave grants to to try to come up with innovative models, and one of those models that they wanted to focus on was pediatric asthma. And at that summit, uh, it was charged with uh, the group wanted to, uh, sorry, get step back a second. Who was there was number one, our awardees, but we also invited some payers and providers to the summit to come up, you know, try to come up with some ideas how to implement uh, value-based payments around pediatric asthma. And one of the things in the asthma that they focused on was to try to uh, find uh, goals, you know, uh, metrics to, to, to look at, uh, try to uh, estimate the results. I'm sorry, I'm in the wrong part of my presentation. <laughs> That's what happens when you do it uh, last minute. Okay, but no, one of the things they want to do was to look at, you know, identify prompting strategies that they could develop these value-based payments around. Uh, they want to uh, find, you know, to look at, try to find metrics that are important to states, MCOs, and looking at these uh, value-based value payments. And one of the things that they took out of it is that uh, they, want the, they wanted the uh, boardies to come up with models, that different models of how to uh, create value-based payments in MCOs and providers and, and, and organizations. They wanted to have these models uh, to be vetted and at the conclusion they'll try to at least by the end of next year have at least one contract in around the country that would use some of these models you know, to try to see how they would work and then can it you know, be, be, be sustained and maybe even you know, can they take these models and try to uh, use them on different other diseases. But my point is, is that CMS now, you know, we are dedicated to trying to not only just pay for uh, services, but now try to you know, do our part in preventing diseases and helping people you know, to, to live better lives. Thank you. Good morning. Um, hopefully everyone can hear me. I thank you, Catherine. So I think my first task is to demystify all of those acronyms that you use to introduce me. <laughs> so uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Cheryl Donald. I am the Deputy Regional Administrator for the Health Resources and Services Administration, which is our acronym HRSA. And we are in the Office of Regional Operations. The New York Regional Office is here in Region 2. And we cover New York, New Jersey, Puerto Rico, and the Virgin Islands. And we actually have a sub-regional office in Puerto Rico that I think many of you have probably interfaced with at some point. Um, so I want to bring you greetings on behalf of our regional administrator, Mr. Ronald Moss, as well as our HRSA acting administrator, Mr. Jim McRae, who is in our headquarters in Rockville, Maryland. So the HRSA Office of Regional Operations is what we consider the face of HRSA. We cover the four jurisdictions of Region 4, and we serve as the local representative for the HRSA administrator. We also serve as a liaison between our 279 grantees that are here in Region 2 and the bureaus and offices of HRSA. I'm joined today by my colleagues. You've already had the opportunity to meet Dr. Tanya Bagan Raggio Ashley. I think she's kind of floating around. She's back there. And then also Dr. George Paracas, who is in the back, if you could just stand up. He is our lead for uh, rural as well as tribal health activities in Region 2. And then also uh, Ms. Shirley Smith, who has joined us as well. She is the regional nurse consultant for our HRSA Maternal and Child Health Bureau. So just wanted to put some connection there for our federal team. Also in our office is Dr. Chandi Ghosh, who takes the lead for our activities in New York State 
as well as um, in Puerto Rico, in our sub-regional office, we have Dr. Claritza Madalve, who is our lead for Puerto Rico, as well as Dr. Madeline Rossi. So I say all that to say, as we continue on with our dialogues here today, if you have any kind of questions or concerns around how HRSA can help support your efforts, feel free to reach out to myself or any members of our team, even if they happen to not be here this morning. So, I want to talk a little bit about HRSA. HRSA is one of the 11 agencies under the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, as uh, Dr. Davis has shared. We're the primary agency responsible for increasing access to health care for people who are uninsured, geographically isolated, or medically vulnerable. This includes people living with HIV AIDS, pregnant women and mothers, their families, and those who are in need of high quality primary health care. Our uh, FY15 budget, we're still working on FY16, is approximately $10 billion, and it supports states, local governments, as well as community-based organizations in delivering that comprehensive, high-quality, preventive, and primary care to patients who uh, may not have the ability to pay for that. We also train and support multi, a multidisciplinary clinical workforce designed to treat the whole patient through culturally competent and accessible care. And we build uh, healthy communities through programs like Home Visiting, Healthy Start, and Rural and Women's Health Initiatives. Um, HRSA supports the training of health professionals through our National Health Service Corps and our Nurse Corps. And we also work on the distribution of providers to areas where they are in need most, whether that's isolated um, areas in rural America or in some of our underserved urban areas, such as East Harlem here in New York City. Um, some of you may not know that HRSA also sees our, oversees our organ donation, bone marrow, and cord uh, blood donation programs. We also compensate individuals who have been hurt or harmed by uh, vaccinations. And we maintain databases to protect against healthcare malpractice, waste, <coughs> fraud, and abuse. Um, so we're also uh, often referred to as the Access Agency. Our Community Health Center program is funded at about $5 billion, and we support 1,300 organizations that operate over 9,000 service delivery care sites to nearly 22 million patients. Many of those health centers are actually located right here in the neighborhood. One in three people living or below, um, at or below poverty rely on HRSA programs, and 35% of our health center uh, patients are actually uninsured. So HRSA programs work to improve health equity by working to reduce and eliminate health disparities. Our uniform data <coughs> system, which is our reporting mechanism for our health centers, indicate that at least 6% of health center users receive care for asthma, and many more are living with asthma who may not come to our health centers for care. Historically, HRSA has supported what we call the asthma collaboratives throughout the country. Many of the stellar programs are actually located here in Region 2 in our four jurisdictions. And these, progr these programs are no longer funded by HRSA, but many of them continue to live on in the asthma uh, preventive um, programs of our community health centers. Our health centers also provide medication through our 340B drug um, discount program. And our health centers in New York, New Jersey, Puerto Rico, and the U.S. Virgin Islands continue to collaborate with their prospective communities to address the wide range of issues that impact children with asthma, as well as looking at programs around tobacco use, smoky cessation, and exposure to secondhand smoke. So we look forward, I'm getting, I'm getting the notice to stop. Uh, so we look forward to our continued collaboration with our fellow um, federal departments and colleagues on the panel. As well as all of you that are in attendance today, we thank you for this opportunity to dialogue in the conversation. Many of our HRSA grantees are here in the room, so please utilize their expertise around uh, addressing the asthma issues. And I'll pass it over to uh, my colleague from HUD. Thank you. Um, uh, thank you. My name is Susan Horowitz, and I'm the <clears throat> Healthy Homes representative for Region 2 out of the Office of uh, Lead Hazard Control and Healthy Homes. One of the fun facts, I guess, is that before I got this job, I didn't even know that HUD had an office like this. <clears throat> and it's a terrific um, opportunity for us to get involved or to show the connection between health and housing. Um, HUD programs and policies to impact asthma disparities. As part of the Federal Interagency Task Force on Combating Asthma Disparities, HUD's role include provision of resources to research the relationship between indoor environments and asthma, provision of guidance and resources to reduce physical environmental factors 
that may lead to or exacerbate asthma symptoms, promotion of the integration of health and housing disciplines. Um, the provision of resources to reduce, to re research the relationship between indoor environments and asthma. We have a Healthy Homes Technical Studies Grants. We give out, it's a competitive grant program. And what that program does, those grants, they are they developing validated assessment tools and improving environmental sampling protocols, protocols, improving upon current residential integrate, integrated pest management IPM protocols, improving indoor air quality, evaluating the efficacy and cost effectiveness of interventions to address high priority residential health and safety hazards. And I might add, in our lead grant program, we have a set, a set aside for the Healthy Homes Initiative. Um, it's money that um, grantees can use to mitigate asthma triggers in the home by cleaning up mold, um, pet dander, and um, other, other um, um, triggers for asthma. It's not a lot of money, but at least it's a start. In terms of provision of guidance and resources to reduce physical environmental factors that may lead to or exacerbate asthma symptoms, HUD has produced, my office actually has uh, produced recent guidance documents that include smoke-free housing, changes in the air, and I think some of you may be aware, most of you should be, that HUD just uh, put out a proposed rule with a 60-day common, peri uh, common period to eliminate smoking in public housing units throughout the nation. And that's really a biggie. Um, it's, it's, it's controversial. Um, just here in New York City alone, we have 178,000 units in NYCHA public housing. Um, hopefully, this will get passed. Um, also, we have an integrated pest management program. Promotion of the integration of health and housing disciplines we give priority points in certain HUD competitive funding applications for, and this is important, the coordination of housing re rehabilitation with health and energy. Applicants are encouraged to coordinate the delivery of housing repair rehabilitation with community hospital or public health programs that utilize community health workers, promotoras, health educators, or similar positions that assess the indoor quality of home environments for conditions that may impact resident health. For example, in the coordination of rehabilitation activities with programs that assess the home environments of asthmatic children for asthma triggers. We do give points in our competitive grant program for that. So my office is making an effort to help reduce um, asthma, uh, you know, asthma in, um, and in children throughout the nation. Thank you for inviting me. Uh, hi, everyone. Um, thanks for having me. I see a lot of familiar faces, but more importantly, I see people I don't know. And having worked on this for a while, that's really exciting. Um, so fun fact, um, uh, I was 10 years old in 1970 when the first Earth Day uh, happened, and we were assigned a, uh, we were assigned to, um, to make a film with a Super 8 camera, if any of you have ever heard of those. Um, <laughs> and I grew up in the suburbs of LA, and we have a wastewater, or we have a, a, a rainwater runoff, stormwater runoff system there, and we wanted to sort of show how bad the pollution was. And so Eric Varnon and I went down to the, we called it the wash, and I looked around. All we saw was sort of really nice greenery and frogs. And so, being good 10 year olds, uh, we went back, and the next day we brought um, trash and, and uh, dishwashing soap with us to, to, uh, to pollute it. Um, <laughs> So uh, I've been atoning for that sin ever since. Um, uh, so I'm from the city health department. Um, we, uh, we do a lot of stuff, and I'm just going to kind of try to highlight some of it that touches on these areas and then end with a couple of entreaties, I think. Um, so uh, the first uh, and one of the most important roles we play is a regulatory role. Uh, we have um, authority over many things uh, health-related, including some aspects that are housing-related. So. Uh, for those of you who don't know, we have uh, Article 151 in the Health Code, which, at least on paper, is among the more progressive um, 
pest related codes around that essentially authorizes the health department to mandate integrated pest management in many circumstances. Um, the realities of implementing that and enforcing it are quite challenging, but it does set a floor in New York City for the way we see pest control needing to happen to control triggers. Um, we also uh, uh, enforce a variety of other uh, related issues related to, um, to the indoor environment and to a lesser extent the outdoor environment. Probably um, the, the most significant contribution I think that we make as a health department um, to the issues that we're talking about today is really around surveillance. Um, so I want to make a plug for a website um, that we call Environment and Health Tracking Portal. Uh, it's nyc.gov slash health slash tracking portal where we put neighborhood level uh, data up around a whole host of issues that relate to this issue to try to both explain what's going on, um, allow people to generate hypotheses, and we hope to become more and more indignant at the disparities that exist across the city in uh, both not just asthma, as Dr. Landrigan has talked to us about, but also in the prevalence of uh, pests and indoor triggers and the quality of services associated with their remediation. So I really, I won't talk about you know, that data except to point out that when we have a 15-fold difference in the prevalence of cockroaches and mice across city neighborhoods, um, we know that the, the quality of the indoor environment, especially in housing, is probably the leading factor in explaining the disparities across the city in asthma symptoms and exacerbations, and that's what we, we really need to tackle. Um, uh, we also do surveillance on air quality, um, and uh, for those of you who don't know, we have the New York City Community Air Survey, and I just want to highlight a couple of things that's important from there. One is the data really matters, and all, many of you are researchers and continue to do the work and get it out there. Um, that found, for example, that air quality across the city doesn't uh, vary really by income, and the great story there is that it helped to create a new set of stakeholders in improving air quality across the city. There's no question that the, that the um, that the impact of poor air quality remains disparate and uh, impacts low-income communities far greater than <coughs> high-income communities, but higher-income communities have really terrible air quality in New York City relative to other parts of the city. Um, so in my last minute, um, I want to queue up a couple of things. One is, later today, uh, my colleagues Carrie Olson and Deborah Nagan will be talking about an exciting study that we're involved in on uh, called a return on investment study. It's a randomized trial. And we're really trying to uh, quantify the savings to the healthcare system from a very simple integrated pest management program to try to embed uh, uh, incentives into the healthcare paying system for, uh, for paying for this. Um, the, the one thing I sort of want to end with is that um, this is really an ideal moment for us to have this conversation between an, a consensus that's emerged scientifically about the importance of indoor triggers, uh, the attempt and at times failure to grapple with them in the housing and housing maintenance market, uh, the incentives on payers um, and healthcare systems to save funding, the reform of Medicaid, um, and the sort of desperate needs of communities out there, this is really the time to, to figure this out, and I think we're gonna, I think we're gonna do it this time. Um, the last thing I want to end with is a plea to also, uh, you know, in my sort of never-ending obsession around pests, um, to really think about not just how we pay for good pest control services, but how we leverage the dollars uh, across, the, across systems right now that are utterly wasted on very poor quality pest control. Uh, landlords buy services and they achieve very little. The EPA and the state DEC do virtually, you know, nothing to regulate the actual practice of pest control, they regulate pesticides. And we need to really think about how to, um, how to make those dollars better spent. So I'll stop there. Good morning, everyone. It's a beautiful sunny day here in New York City. After yesterday's rain, hopefully everything is, everyone is breathing more easily this morning. 
My name is Doug Fish, and uh, I'm one of the medical directors in the New York State Department of Health, Office of Health Insurance Programs. Uh, a fun fact for me is I love the weather and meteorology and uh, um, grew up in central Ohio, a little town, Mount Vernon, outside of Columbus, about an hour northeast of Columbus. Been in uh, New York about 22 years, and New York is my favorite state. <laughs> Would like to, uh... <coughs> it's a great state. You have everything, right? We have everything here. Uh, would like to thank Amisha and the conveners, uh, HHS, EPA, HUD, and others for inviting the New York State Department of Health to speak to you on our delivery system reform incentive payment program or DISRIP program and how is it is addressing the asthma challenge. As we know, the health of our Medicaid members is not optimal when it comes to asthma. And this is borne out in our costs. So what I'm showing you is a little bit of data. Uh, our annual emergency department spend per Medicaid member. And in gray, you can see that the average spend for the general Medicaid member is around $100 per year. This is data from 2014. Um, it is about two and a half times that for those Medicaid members with asthma. About four times that for our members, our heart members, health and recovery plan members, those with serious mental illness and substance use. And if you have the comorbidities of mental illness or substance use and asthma, the costs are nearly sevenfold those of the general Medicaid population. So if we look at the percentage of these heart members with asthma, it is higher than what we saw for the 2013 numbers at 10%. It is 12% of our uh, members with serious mental illness or substance use who have asthma. So if you look at the inpatient spend now, again, a similar array in gray. Uh, the average spend for the Medicaid member for inpatient care is around $1,200 over twice that for those with asthma and for those with mental illness, substance use, and asthma, uh, over 10 times that of the general Medicaid population. And I thought you would like to see uh, what it is broken out for children as well, uh, less than age 22. So this is the inpatient spend on the left and the ER spend on the right. And the statewide average is in orange at around oh, oh, a little over $500 and two and a half times that for Medicaid members who are children with asthma at over $1,300 per year. And similar ER spend uh, around $95 for the statewide average and then uh, uh, over $200 uh, uh, ER spend per Medicaid member uh, under the age of 22. And then it's broken out by the 11 DISRIP regions and you can see this pattern holds true. So the response is that in April 2014, Governor Cuomo announced that New York State and the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services finalized the agreement on the Medicaid Redesign Team Waiver Amendment, allowing New York to reinvest $8 billion of the $17 billion in uh, federal savings that had been generated by the forms, reforms for our 6.3 million members, with the goal to transform the state's health care system, bend the Medicaid cost curve, and assure access to high-quality care for our members. There are 25 uh, performing provider systems through the DISRIP program, 10 are upstate, 11 are within New York City, uh, three are in the Mid-Hudson Valley, and one on Long Island. And with asthma as an ambulatory care sensitive condition, and where the severity of illness is minor or moderate, this leads to opportunity to avoid hospitalizations and readmissions. These are the uh, uh, performing provider systems who chose uh, from the menu of options of projects, asthma-related projects, and the one I'll focus on is Project 3DII, the expansion of asthma home-based self-management programs, which includes a home environmental assessment, education on the role of the environment and asthma control, uh, modification of the home environment as needed, uh, self-management education, as well as coordinated care and a root cause analysis when admissions and ear utilization occur related to asthma. These are the regions across the state, um, and, and as you can see, there is a focus uh, in the most populated uh, regions of the state uh, for the performing provider systems who are choosing the asthma projects, and uh, the uh, golden circles are where there are also prevention agenda-related asthma uh, priorities through either the local health departments or local hospitals. These are the metrics on which the asthma uh, efforts will be um, uh, monitored through the five years of the program. The domain two are system transformation metrics, potentially avoidable ER visits and readmissions. The domain three project specific metrics are around prevention quality indicators for adults and pediatrics, ARC measures, and asthma medication ratios and medication management for people with asthma. And these are performance-based metrics uh, from years two through five. And then the domain four metrics are population-wide asthma emergency department uh, visit rates per 10,000 members from our SPARCS or inpatient database. 
And no healthcare reform is complete without also transforming how we pay for healthcare. And New York has uh, developed a five-year roadmap for value-based payments. Uh, on the left is an example of what would be the all-in uh, ACO type of model of care, but we can have also bundles of care, either episodic or continuous uh, chronic care bundles, and asthma is one of those under consideration, and there's been a pulmonary clinical advisory group meeting around asthma and other pulmonary conditions. So I'll just conclude in that uh, the PPSs around the state are working with the asthma projects through the asthma coalitions and the Healthy Neighborhoods programs. Uh, the PPSs have submitted their second quarterly reports, and those are under review by DOH, and they will report quarterly, and payments are based on every six-month reporting and outcomes. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Jesus Urizari Mora. I come from Puerto Rico. And uh, as a fun fact, uh, we had a drought like for about six months, and, but it's been raining on the island for the last two weeks. So please don't blame me if, uh, for the rainy day yesterday in New York. So I hope, I hope not, not me. Don't blame me. Uh, I'm joined here by uh, uh, people from the department. I, I, I'm sorry, I, I'm a public health person. I've been around in public health for the last uh, 32 years. I'm a demographer myself, and uh, I'm joined here by uh, Dr. Jessica Idisari, who is the Secretary of Health Promotion. Uh, just please stand up so everyone knows who you are. Ms. Wanda Hernandez, she is the Director of Asthma Program in Puerto Rico, and Dr. Lourdes Soto uh, Garrido, she is also uh, Director of Research Institute for Global Health Education and Promotion. So. They're really the experts. Uh, I, I'm, as I said, I'm not, a, I'm not a physician. I'm a, a person from public health. And being from public health, I know, I know the, the importance of prevention uh, approach and, in asthma prevention. So I'm going to say a little bit about what be, we've been doing in Puerto Rico in terms of the asthma program. It has been in existence for, uh, since uh, 2003 through funding from the CDC. Currently, it's been funded by the Preventive Health and Health Services Block Grant. And the main goal is to maintain an asthma surveillance system and to implement as asthma control strategic plan with the co collaboration of asthma partners, including Puerto Rico Asthma Coalition. The asthma program includes uh, three major components, partnership, surveillance, and health promotion and health education. Through partnerships, the program has been able to update the asthma strategic plan, recruit more asthma collaborators, maintain the surveillance system, increase asthma awareness, and educate people on how to avoid environmental asthma triggers, partner with local stakeholders, help residents manage their own health, and develop public policy, among others. As, as you see in the data, Puerto Rico has uh, a very high prevalence of asthma among children and adults. It's a, uh, for adults, it's about 10.6%, and um, for children, it's uh, near, nearly 14%, which is higher for, uh, than the US. Uh, and uh, these this, uh, prevalence rates are uh, higher among low income and uh, people with uh, less scolarity. About 50% uh, of the people with asthma in Puerto Rico have this chronic respiratory disease on control. Therefore, asthma still represents a public health problem in Puerto Rico, as, as Dr. Uh, 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 I forgot his name, uh, Landrigan was mentioning, it should be treated as, a, as an epidemic in the island. The program's health promotion interventions have been focused in provi providing capacity building to health professionals in the adequate use of the NAAP guidelines and in providing evidence-based training and, and uh, trainer activities to propitiate a multiplying effect in asthma education. The asthma trainers are certified to provide training to other health professionals and educate patients as well. Up to date, uh, 2,542 health professionals have been trained in the use of these guidelines, and there are 188 additional asthma certified counselors across the island, including home visiting nurses and other non physician health professionals. Moreover, in also in collaboration with uh, its university partners, the program has reached about 175 teacher, teachers and school staff follow indoor air quality practices and provide educational asthma activities. Next year, uh, through an educational effort with the Medical Sciences Campus, uh, 600 and health, uh, health school teachers will be trained in asthma and indoor air quality efforts. So we look forward to continue this partnership with the 
in, in in-home asthma interventions that can bring uh, significant health benefits and cost savings uh, to people, but more importantly, uh, to improve the quality of life of people living with asthma in Puerto Rico. And thank you again for for invitation, and we look forward to uh, work together with EPA and DHHS. Thank you.